Hi. In this video, we're going to talk about all the different ways that you can secure your database inside of Microsoft SQL Server. Now, I'm going to be doing this a little differently than uh, the previous videos in the way that uh, some of the advanced topics are going to be available only for subscribers. And that's mainly because I've got some proprietary information there that I use uh, for trainings that I deliver. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jayanth. I've been doing database consulting and trainings for quite some time now. I've been working on Microsoft SQL Server from the SQL 2000 days, working as a database developer, an administrator, and an architect before I finally started my own consulting firm. Now, uh, in this video, we're going to start talking about uh, the, the, the first and most basic things as far as SQL Server is concerned. And we're going to focus mainly on the security aspects of it. So uh, let's get started with exactly what are the different ways that you can secure your database. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that this is basically uh, based on top of uh, a methodology or a technique called defense in depth. And defense in depth is actually something that's coming from the military rather than database or software or IT. And what it means basically is it's a, a tactic where uh, you kind of assume that you cannot really defeat the enemy. So your intention is mainly to make it difficult for them with each step so that they just don't want to persist. And uh, one of the best examples of this is when the Germans were trying to uh, invade Russia. Uh, during World War Two, I guess uh, two or one, I can't remember which one. But uh, what happened was that the Germans were infiltrating into Russian uh, front lines, and they have the front line, which is the first layer of defense. And uh, as soon as the front line was broken, basically uh, uh, they got defeated. Uh, the Russians used a scorched earth policy, where they basically just destroyed all the fields and uh, the poison the water supply to make sure that as they retreat and the Germans pursue them they run out of resources that they can live off the land with and the intention here was that as they get further and further into Russian territory it becomes even more difficult for them to progress because they just just don't have the resources to pursue or continue the war and uh, the intention was that as they went further and further into the Russian territory uh, winter came in and when winter came the uh, the germans were pretty much trapped inside of russia without any kind of uh food or water supply uh, any kind of heating and uh, they, they couldn't even retreat back because the winter has already started and they're kind of stuck over there and uh, that's kind of the technique that uh, even in security and said cyber security we use where we want to add layers to our databases or basically any infrastructure for that matter and uh, the first one is obvious obviously to just prevent the casual uh, infiltrator the uh, hacker from uh, trying to access your resources and then you have encryption and other layers as well which you build on and the idea is that with each layer it becomes even more difficult to get access and at some point the person who's trying to access the data will obviously feel like it's just not worth the effort and would give up. Now having said that you cannot really guarantee that your database never will get hacked because at the end of the day if someone has enough time and enough resources and they're persistent enough they will usually find a way which is why it's kind of well understood that there is no such thing as a hack proof database or hack proof data for that matter so the only intention that you're trying to do here is make it more and more difficult for them to get to that goal now inside of sql server we've got a number of different ways that you can protect your data the first and the most important by far i cannot stress this enough is principle of least privileges which means that once you create your database objects you have your tables and your store procedures you grant the bare minimum permissions to the users and logins for them to be able to do their job and that in itself is more than maybe 70% or 80% of what you need to do to protect your data. Almost always what happens is people are able to elevate their permissions so you, I've seen a lot of cases where service accounts for databases are running in SA um, uh, system admin. Uh, I've seen SA accounts enabled and actually being even used in connection strings. Uh, not to mention unnecessary permissions and privileges given just because it's easier to just give all the permissions rather than figure it out individually. Uh, definitely a bad practice to go ahead and use uh, privileged accounts. So the first thing we want to do is understand and learn how to use the uh, principle of least privileges. Uh, 
Then you have row level security, which is uh, an, a layer added on top of the privileges. So previously we could only control access to the table, but not the data. So once a person has access to a table, they could pretty much view everything in the table. Uh, now with row level security, we also have additional ability to control what data inside the table they can see. So this is especially useful for multi-tenant systems, which we can talk about later. Uh, next, we have dynamic data masking. It's not really a very powerful security feature and its intention is only to mask the data. So people who are already having sufficient permissions have ways of bypassing this information. And uh, it's not going to guarantee that uh, the data is uh, not viewable, but it'll do a good enough job to make sure that the casual observer doesn't have access to information that's just lying around. Having said that, the next one is where we get really serious about uh, data. So we have cell level encryption, uh, which is protecting your data at rest inside a column. So that's uh, basically where the data inside a table is encrypted in a var binary format. So if you try to read the table, all you'll see is some kind of binary value. Having said that, uh, when you're moving the data over the network, for example, displaying that information on a web page, the data is still unencrypted. So there are ways that you can view the data as long as it's outside the database. Now, obviously, because of that limitation, we have the next one, which is always encrypted, where the data is protected not only in rest, but also in motion. And uh, what it means for us is uh, the data in the database is obviously encrypted, and even the data that's coming out of the database is encrypted. So the only place where unencrypted data is being viewed is on the web server, on the website, rather than anywhere in the network or the database. And this gives you protection against rogue DBAs. Uh, a good example would be the one that's happening right now with Paytm, an Indian finance company, uh, payment portal, where uh, it looks like they've been uh, hacked or attacked by ransomware. And uh, seems that the problem is related to some internal employee who's done that. But uh, that's apparently the rumor going around. I'm not sure about uh, how accurate that is, but uh, we're still waiting for more information on that. Now, having said that, the next one is transparent data encryption and transparent data encryption is all about protecting the data in the MDF, LDF files. So it's not really about protecting the data in a column in a table. It's about protecting the MDF and LDF files. Typically, uh, the intention here is someone shouldn't be able to pick up your MDF, LDF files and restore it on another server and then uh, grant themselves additional permissions and view the data. So that's what transparent data encryption is. Uh, the backup encryption is basically uh, a layer on top of transparent data encryption if you could think about it that way because uh, what's happening is that previously backups could be taken but they weren't encrypted so you needed a third party tool to do the encryption. However, uh, with newer versions of SQL Server you can also go ahead and do backup encryption where the, uh, the backup file and the contents of the backup file itself is encrypted. Now you might not think that's a big deal, but essentially what's happening is that a lot of the time the theft that happens in companies in data centers has to do with stolen tape drives and backups. It's much easier to get a backup stolen than hire a hacker who will uh, infiltrate the database. Uh, the next one is obviously server level and database level audits. And this is not really going to protect you from any uh, hacking or uh, data theft, but it's important to understand how it occurred so you can prevent it in future. And also basically make sure that uh, you have an idea or enough proof to really uh, verify that the person that you're accusing is the person who is actually uh, responsible for the data theft. Then you have the standard basic stuff that we all expected to do, which is, you know, block, block the uh, port number 1433, change it from the default ports, uh, configure the firewall, use SSL when you're uh, transferring data over the network, uh, a couple of other configuration information such as changing the SA or disabling the SA account. Uh, standard stuff basically but uh, again these are all one-time activity that you need to do and the last one obviously being good development practices which is again stuff like protecting the data in connection strings and code check-in that you do also making sure that you don't use dynamic SQL and if you are using it but you use it properly you go ahead and do validation on data fields that you're being used uh, that you're using to do data entry such as uh, password screens and uh, any text box that you might have. So these are the kind of stuff that you want to be doing. And if you do these things right, then you'll pretty much be doing everything that you can do to protect your data. There are a couple of other things you can do at the hardware level, at the BIOS level, such as Windows updates, uh, etc. But uh, we're going to focus mostly on what you can do inside of SQL Server. So we're trying to be platform agnostic in this case. Now, as I mentioned, uh, defense in depth is about defense in layers. So each layer is basically represented here in this diagram with the first one and the most important ones being the firewall, 
uh, principle of least privileges for all level security. Then it's best basically just good coding practices, making sure your Windows updates are happening, uh, keeping track of audits, etc. And obviously, if you have uh, finance data, if you need to be HIPAA compliant or uh, PCI DSS compliant, uh, depending on what kind of uh, criteria you're using, there's again common criteria as well. So uh, you might have to go ahead and do additional things like encryption of data, etc. So th those are the different layers and each one builds on top of the other. So the uh, from implementation standpoint, you could think of it as top to bottom, where you need to make sure that the first half is done properly before you can go to the next and the last option. So go ahead and make sure that you uh, you uh, try and follow this as much as possible, especially if you're having credit card information, payment information, healthcare information, anything that you think is sensitive. And uh, that's kind of important. And I'll try and give you an example of it in future videos as well. Uh, the difference between hashing and encryption, well, uh, there's already a video about that. I highly encourage you to go ahead and look into that where I demonstrate the difference between hashing and encryption. But uh, for a quick summary, encryption basically makes sure that every time you type a value, you get a different encrypted output. So if I type the letter A, I might get one the first time around and I might get seven the next time around. But if I do hashing, it's always going to be the same value. So every time the letter A comes in, it's always going to be one, for example. And that gives me some kind of idea about some kind of information about uh, what that data is. For example, if I have a customer table and I've got uh, the first name, last name, and I've got gender, but gender is encrypted, I can still, uh, gender is hashed, I can still look at the name and figure out which hash value belongs to female and which hash value belongs to male. And that gives me a good idea about uh, uh, the details of uh, that particular data. Another way that we typically do these kind of things is uh, if I have the customer, I can Google the customer and figure out their date of birth online. And then using that hash value for the date of birth, I can figure out all the other people who have the same date of birth. So there are ways that uh, these things get misused. So ideally, you want to use encryption wherever you can. Having said that, the problem with encryption is that it is more resource intensive. It requires additional CPU. It does make the disk a little bit more uh, uh, heavily utilized just because of the fact that it has to do the encryption in the first place and that requires additional compute resources. So for highly transactional systems, encryption definitely does have a drawback. Uh, you'll also see there are additional impacts in terms of things like transparent data encryption where it's not just the user database that gets encrypted, it is even temp databases as well. Troubleshooting wise, you'll see that when you use encryption, you'll find that execution plans and other troubleshooting information are masked. So you might not always get all the information that you want. And as a result, troubleshooting performance issues become a little bit more difficult when you're working with encrypted data. Uh, there is one more thing that you need to be very careful about and that is the use of the master key. Now as you saw there are certain things that don't require encryption which is the principle of these privileges, dynamic data masking, role level security. These guys you don't really have encryption happening in the background. It's it uses a different mechanism to protect the data. But at the same time you've got things like cell level encryption, backup encryption, always encrypted, transparent data encryption. All of these guys who use encryption require a master key. And the master key is basically the key that protects the key that encrypts the data. So an important thing to keep in mind here is when you have a master key on your database, if you lose the master key, if you forget the password for the master key, if the master key gets corrupted for some reason or you just misplace it, you're done for. There's really nothing else you can do to bring back that data. That's the whole point of encryption to make sure that nobody can access the data if they don't have the master key. So it does make the life of the DBA that much more difficult simply because without the master key, the choices, their ability to bring back the data is highly restricted. And uh, naturally, this is not really a good thing. This is kind of the basic idea even behind ransomware, where rather than you using your master key, the hacker uses a separate master key and encrypts the whole thing. And unless he gives you the master key uh, after you pay the ransom, there's no way that you're gonna be able to de decrypt the data. So uh, it's a double-edged sword, mainly it protects your data, but it makes life that much more difficult. There is a risk associated with encrypting your data, which is why I find a lot of DBAs hesitant and uh, basically a bit more stressed out about using uh, encryption in the databases. And uh, 
often what happens is that they will resist it initially but at the end of the day when you have a compliance metric that you need to be uh, following there's really not much choice so go ahead and just implement it as long as you take the basic precautions you should be fine we'll be talking about that in more detail when we get to these topics again uh, once you encrypt your data integrating with other systems also becomes that much more complicated for example you can see always on uh, SSIS always encrypted especially has a lot of issues in terms of integrating the data with other systems as well so we'll talk about some of that later on well that's kind of the uh, the broad scope of what we're going to do in this series of videos as you can see there's quite a lot to cover so I'm going to be breaking this down into smaller chunks uh, with each video focusing on a particular topic and uh, like I mentioned before what's going to happen is some of these topics are going to be available only to subscribers so I highly encourage you to go ahead uh, like the video subscribe and uh, stay tuned for more information coming your way well, that's it. Uh, thank you for watching this video and uh, see you soon.